Welcome everyone. I'm Lena Chow, founder of Bob's Last Marathon Foundation. I know you're all excited as I am to hear from our distinguished panel. So Dr. Stephen E. Arnold is professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and translational neurology head and managing director of the Interdisciplinary Brain Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. Felicia Greenfield is executive director of the Penn Memory Center, where she leads a team of social workers and interns who provide psychoeducation and ongoing support to families caring for older adults. Dr. Jason Kalawish, professor of medicine, medical ethics and health policy and neurology at the University of Pennsylvania and co-director of the Penn Memory Center. His most recent book, The Problem of Alzheimer's, How Science, Culture, and Politics Turned a Rare Disease into a Crisis and What We Can Do About It, is now available in paperback. Thank you, Lena. I'm, I'm Stephen Arnold uh, from Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, and I'm going to be talking about where we are with diagnosis and treatment. And you know, what I have to say is that we've made tremendous strides in our ability to diagnose Alzheimer's disease and other causes of cognitive decline and dementia in older people. And in terms of treatment, we've had a major scientific advance this past year uh, with the news that amyloid lowering immunotherapies can slow down the progression of Alzheimer's. I'll be coming back to the new amyloid treatments, lecanemab or lecembi, as it's called by its brand name, and aducanemab or agihelm. But first, let me talk about where we are with diagnosis. So as we get older, we all experience changes in our memory and thinking. Uh, there are senior moments where you may have trouble remembering a name or why you walked into a room, or maybe it takes more effort to get organized and out the door in the morning. These experiences are, are almost universal as we age, but when it's more than a little trouble, when there's a significant difference in our memory and thinking from usual, and especially if it's interfering with our daily functioning, this is a signal that there may be a disease. There are lots of causes of cognitive impairment. Not everything is Alzheimer's disease, and so it's important to get a proper diagnosis with an experienced healthcare provider. The first step is to determine if there truly is a problem. Aside from recognizing the symptoms of memory loss, there are a number of good screening tools, brief memory and thinking tests that can help see if there is a problem or not. Sometimes though, it takes more in-depth testing by a neuropsychologist to suss out if someone has a memory problem. In Boston, we sometimes get these physics professors coming in worried that they have Alzheimer's because they can only think 12 moves ahead in a chess game when they used to be able to think 18 moves ahead. And these folks may do fine on a cognitive screening test, but based on where they started from, they actually may have a serious problem emerging. And so a neuropsychology evaluation can help. Then it's important to have a good general medical checkup with lab tests. Thyroid disease, certain vitamin deficiencies, side effects from some medicines people use for sleep or bladder control can cause memory problems. Depression is another condition we want to be on the lookout for. Most everyone has ups and downs, but if depression takes hold, everything in the brain can shut down. Thinking and memory get foggy and it can look like dementia. We also recommend an MRI or CAT scan of the brain to make sure that there are no tumors or fluid collections or silent strokes. Some of these conditions that we discover from time to time also are, are quite treatable. If there is a noteworthy cognitive decline and a good medical and neurologic exam doesn't turn up any alternative explanation, then statistically Alzheimer's is the most common cause in people over 60. But there are other causes that can look very similar. Vascular cognitive impairment is due to the long-term effects of high blood pressure affecting small blood vessels feeding the brain. We used to call this hardening of the arteries. Lewy body disease is a cousin of Parkinson's disease that also causes symptoms that overlap with Alzheimer's disease. Frontotemporal dementia is another, and there's a very long list of other rare conditions that do so too. 
we used to say that the only way you can be 100% sure that a person has Alzheimer's is if you look at brain tissue under a microscope after they die, and it shows the telltale amyloid plaques and tau tangles of Alzheimer's disease. Based on the clinical symptoms alone, even the most experienced Alzheimer's neurologists are correct with the diagnosis only 70 or maybe 80% of the time. And this may have been okay when we had no real treatment for Alzheimer's, but now it's not good enough as we enter a new era with medicines that specifically target Alzheimer's disease amyloid, but also come with some possibly serious, even fatal side effects. And we need to be very confident in our diagnosis if we're gonna give someone one of these new medicines. And diagnosis is where the Alzheimer's field has made huge progress. If the disease is defined by the amyloid plaques and tau tangles, then we have to be able to detect and measure them to make a certain diagnosis. And we now have a range of biomarker tests that can tell us if there are plaques and tangles in the brain with very high certainty, almost 100%. So the most widely available are spinal tap tests that measure amyloid and tau and spinal fluid. But there are also PET scans that use radio-labeled tr tracers to show brain amyloid uh, on X-ray. And these amyloid PET scans are expensive and not widely available or used, but if positive, they are diagnostic of the disease. There are also PET scans to measure the amount of tau tangles in the brain in Alzheimer's. And these are still only used in research where they're especially helpful in measuring how far the disease has spread through the brain. The newest, most exciting, and potentially transformative advances coming, uh, coming right now are diagnosis with blood tests. These are mostly used in research so far, but new ultra-sensitive laboratory tests can measure the very low levels of tau proteins that leak out into the blood from the brain or spinal fluid. And if the tau levels are high, the accuracy for diagnosis compared to, uh, based on the blood test, compared to spinal fluid or PET scans is around 90%. This is good enough for screening, but if you're about to commit someone to a, a new course of immunotherapy, you'll need to be even more certain with a spinal fluid test or PET scan. So let me move on to treatment. There are medicines like Dinepazil or Aricept, Rivastigmine or Exelon, Galantamine or Razodyne, Memantine or Namenda, and we've had these for the last 20 or 30 years. These are safe, and most people have no or very mild side effects with them, but they provide only very modest benefit for some vague number of people, keeping people a little more stable in their daily functioning for a little longer than if they were not taking them. But the big news, as I said, over the last year is the accelerated approval by the FDA for two anti-amyloid immunotherapies, and a third drug in this family is likely to follow soon too. Educanumab and lecanemab are drugs that attack and clear out amyloid plaque proteins from the brain in Alzheimer's. The drugs are administered, administered by an intravenous infusion once or twice a month. And what we've learned from the large clinical research trials with these drugs is that they're both very effective at clearing amyloid. Lecanemab reduces amyloid load in the brain an average of maybe 70%, and aducanumab even more, reducing amyloid maybe as much as 90%. And this reduction actually brings people's levels back down almost to normal, if not normal. And as a secondary effect, they also reduce tau levels. So that is what the biomarkers show with these new drugs. What happens clinically to people, which is what we really care about. Over the course of the 18 month clinical trial for lecanemab, most everyone in the placebo group and the active lecanemab group still got worse in terms of memory and functioning. But the people receiving lecanemab declined more slowly, 27% more slowly. Statistically, this was a highly significant difference and benefit for the, the, the active drug. For aducanumab, there were two big trials. One of them showed no clinical benefit between the active drug and the placebo groups, and the other showed marginally slower decline in the active aducanumab 
group. Now, I want to emphasize that these findings are a huge scientific advance. After 40 years and billions of dollars of research chasing amyloid, these studies do, for the first time, convincingly demonstrate that if you can clear amyloid in the brain in people with al Alzheimer's, not just lab mice with Alzheimer's disease, but people, um, and that clearing this can moderate the clinical course of the disease. But do you change it enough to make a meaningful difference in someone's day-to-day -day life? That's still a question that we have. And at what risk and cost? About 20 to 40% of people can have side effects, including brain swelling and micro hemorrhages. Most of these are benign and, not, and just noticed incidentally on MRI scan, but they can be serious, causing headache, stroke, seizures, or even death. And the financial costs of the drugs will be high, between $25,000 and $30,000 a year, plus the cost of infusion services, MRI scans, and other lab tests to monitor for side effects and more. So, you know, while they are successful, um, while clearing amyloid or reducing amyloid does moderate the course of Alzheimer's disease, it's not enough. One thing is clear in the data is that these amyloid immunotherapies, um, for these amyloid immunotherapies, is that Alzheimer's dementia is driven by more than just amyloid plaques or tau tangles. It's complicated. We know there are important roles for inflammation, vascular factors, metabolic factors, oxidative stress, neuroplasticity, and many other fundamental cell biology factors that go off in the disease. And any combination of these may be even more important than the amyloid or tau. And that's why continued research is so important into these contributors. But while the research moves forward, there are other things that we can all do now to optimize the brains we have in whatever shape they are. Physical exercise, mental and social stimulation, a heart-healthy, brain-healthy diet, restful sleep, and stress management. All of these are helpful. And for people in the throes of dementia, our most effective treatment is good care. And so here, I'm delighted to turn the microphone over to my friend and colleague, Felicia Greenfield, to, to talk about where we are with personalized caregiving. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. Um, that was really helpful and important information. And I, for one, am optimistic about the future um, when there is a safe disease modifying treatment. Um, <clears throat> so I'm delighted to join the conversation here today. And I'm grateful to you, Lena, for inviting me to talk to you all about a person-centered approach to dementia caregiving. Uh, first, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that outpatient clinical practices that treat people with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias are limited by what they can do by what they can do by way of care, um, as you just heard from Dr. Arnold. By and large, at this point in time, non-pharmacological approaches to care are considered the gold standard in caring for people living with dementia. These approaches implemented and delivered by caregivers can be applied in community-based settings, such as at home and in long-term or memory care facilities. In his seminal work on dementia, scholar Tom Kitwood highlights relationship, uniqueness, and embodiment as the elements of personhood or sense of self. Because Alzheimer's and related dementias can rob us of our sense of self, we should prioritize person-centered care for those living with dementia. Person-centered care is a philosophy of care that prioritizes the needs of the person living with dementia. This is achieved by knowing the individual through an interpersonal relationship and understanding that a person's environment has as much effect on the brain as the brain does on the person's abilities. High quality person-centered care affirms selfhood through recognition. People with dementia need comfort in order to feel safe when they might otherwise feel as if they're falling apart. It's care that's respectful. People with dementia need attachment when they so often feel out of place. And it's also one of trust. 
People with dementia need to be involved in past and current interests and sources of meaning, and they need an identity. This helps them know who they are and have a sense of continuity with the past. Caregivers are key in helping them maintain their identity, and this can be done by helping people whose cognition is declining by upholding or telling their story as a way of maintaining their individuality and their humanity. Through research, commonalities among models and practices of person-centered care have been identified. These include supporting a sense of self through relationship-based care and services, providing individualized activities and meaningful engagement, and providing education and coaching for caregivers in their efforts to support the person living with dementia. At this point, I'd like to share six recommendations for delivering person-centered care. These recommendations were published in the Gerontologist Journal in 2018 in an article titled Fundamentals in Person-Centered Care for Individuals Living with Dementia. These recommendations are meant for families caring for a person with dementia in the home, as well as for facility-based care professionals. The first recommendation put forth is to really know the person with dementia. The person living with dementia is more than a diagnosis. It's important to know the unique and whole person, including his or her values, beliefs, interests, abilities, likes and dislikes, both from the past and in the present. This information should inform every interaction and experience. Family members can be called upon to tell the person with dementia's story if they're unable to do it themselves. For example, what did they do for a living? From what did they derive a sense of joy, meaning, and purpose? Who do they love and what made or makes them happy? In a care facility, mementos of these qualities can be displayed in the room through pictures or symbols of their life before dementia. Next, it's important to recognize and accept the person's reality. We need to see the world from the perspective of the individual living with dementia and avoid trying them to get you to get them to join you in your version of reality. Doing so recognizes behavior as a form of communication, thereby promoting effective and empathetic communication that validates feelings and connects the person in their reality. One way that this can be done is by implementing the rules of improv comedy by taking a yes and approach. If the person living with dementia insists, for example, that the dome on the top of the building across the street is spinning, don't argue. Join the person in their reality by explain, exclaiming, wow, would you look at that? And then either redirecting them or having a little fun by going further with them. There's a wonderful episode on the This American Life podcast called Magic Words, and it's dated in the uh, August 15th, 2014 archive, and I would encourage you to listen to that for more on this technique. The third recommendation is to identify and support ongoing opportunities for meaningful engagement. Every experience and interaction can be seen as an opportunity for engagement. Engagement should be meaningful to and purposeful for the person living with dementia. It should support their interests and preferences, allow for choice and success, and recognize that even when dementia is severe, the person can still experience joy, comfort, and meaning in life. This brings us back to the first recommendation. Draw on what you know about the person's past occupation and what brought meaning to their life. These are at the core of the person's identity, which tends to remain static. If the person was a doctor before they had dementia, consult with them about a symptom. Ask questions they may have answers for. Ask for medical advice, even if you don't use it. When a former physicist that was in our care began pulling copper out of old television sets and contorting it into sculptures, his wife began collecting old TVs and encouraged him to spend his time doing this thing that seemed to calm him and provide a sense of purpose. 
She even went so far as to frame some of his work and they were invited to show his work at a local art gallery, which brought them in both an immense amount of joy. The fourth recommendation is to build and nurture authentic caring relationships. People with dementia should be part of relationships that treat them with dignity and respect and where their individuality is always supported. This type of caring relationship is about being present and concentrating on the interaction rather than the task. It's about doing with rather than doing for as part of a supportive and mutually beneficial relationship. If the plot of a television program can no longer be followed, just sitting together and holding hands with the television on like you used to do can feel warm and comforting to both people. If language is compromised, just being together and doing something enjoyable, like a walk in nature or planting flowers in a garden can bring people together in relationship. The fifth recommendation is to create and maintain a supportive community for individuals, families, and long-term care staff. A supportive community allows for comfort and creates opportunities for success. It's a community that values each person and respects individual differences, celebrates accomplishments and occasions, and provides access to and opportunities for autonomy, engagement, and shared experience. Involve friends, family, neighbors, or facility staff to parties or celebrations that recognize the person with dementia. I personally know of two couples who renewed their marriage vows in front of an audience while the spouse with dementia was in memory care. Too often support networks begin to shrink, so it's contingent upon the caregiver to create opportunities for community and connection. Don't be afraid to ask, even if people don't come around or call as much as they used to. And finally, evaluate care practices regularly and make appropriate changes. There are tools available to assess person-centered care practice. It's important to regularly evaluate practices and models and make changes to interactions, programs, and practices as needed. As the illness progresses, modifications will need to be made. The recommendations provided here may need to be revisited or revised as the person with dementia changes over time. Um, I wanna thank you for your time. And I would like to recognize that the recommendations I put forth demand much from caregivers who may already feel overwhelmed. So it's important to know that there are resources such as counseling and coaching available to help you with this process. With that said, now I'd like to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Dr. Jason Karlowish, who will talk to you about policies that support families living with dementia. Well, thank you, Felicia. Greetings. Hello, everyone. I'm joining you uh, from my home in Philadelphia, just a few miles from the University of Pennsylvania's campus. It's a pleasure to be here. My colleague, Steve Arnold, talked about how we've made and we will continue to make some path breaking and even spectacular advances in developing better diagnostics and especially better therapeutics, particularly the therapeutics that target the mechanisms of the diseases. Uh, and I can identify the patients who are most likely to respond to therapies. So what does that mean? Well, we should expect that Alzheimer's disease is becoming a treatable disease. In words of pharma, they would call it a druggable disease. But we shouldn't expect that every cause of disabling cognitive impairments will be treatable, certainly not curable. Stephen said that, and I'm reiterating the point. Not everyone is eligible for the drugs that have been um, developed and the findings from research over the last 20 years, 30 years, has been heterogeneity, namely that the typical person with Alzheimer's has not just Alzheimer's pathology, but other pathologies. So there's a real policy making uh, 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 implication to that, which is we are going to have to learn how to live with disabling cognitive impairments, or in a word, how to learn to live with dementia, disabling cognitive impairments. We may have slow for some patients, uh, the course of their disease, perhaps for some completely arrest it, but we need to live with the fact that we will have to live with dementia. So let's talk about that. How can we set up a society in America that uh, allows us to live well with dementia? I think we can break this into two parts. First, how will persons living with dementia and their caregivers carry on with their life? 
in particular with the uh, uh, benefiting from the kind of interventions and supports that Felicia Greenfield described. And second, how will persons living with dementia die of it? So let's first start with living with the disease. So Felicia explained that we have the means to make these diseases livable. For both patients and for caregivers, we have what's known as long-term care services and supports. That's what she described. But those aren't routinely available. In America, we have a federally funded social insurance program for health care. It's called Medicare. And in the Medicare statute signed into law in 1965 by President Johnson, there is an explicit list of items of interventions that Medicare does not cover. They include hearing aids, plastic surgery, and custodial care. Now, in 1965, that was the term used to describe the care that someone gave to another person who was disabled from an illness, custodial care. Think about that, what that word suggests. It's as if the person is a building to be swept and mopped, etc., not a person who needs care. But that was the way we thought about it back then. It was custodial care, and the statute explicitly prohibits it. So long-term care services and supports are not supported by Medicare. Medicare supports hospital-delivered services and outpatient-delivered services. It supports the delivery of medical care. So for example, Dr. Arnold talked about some spectacular diagnostics and therapeutics that are coming out. Those may be covered by Medicare. There's been debate about that, but I expect that they will be. But the kind of services that Felicia Greenfield talked about are not routinely provided. Indeed, at our memory center, access to people like Felicia and her colleagues is available, but it's made possible by a generous gift from a grateful patient's spouse. Without that donation, we couldn't provide the long-term care services and supports that are the standard of care after diagnosis. Put another way, if we relied on Medicare billing to support our memory center, we would not be able to provide the services and supports that are so essential. And again, I'm very encouraged about the prospects of the treatments that will slow the progress of the disease, but that will only extend the period of time that people need long-term care services and supports. We're not going to drug our way out of the need to care, and so we're going to have to face that as a society. Right now, access to social insurance for long-term care services and supports is made possible on a state-by-state -state basis through Medicaid. Not Medicare, but Medicaid. Medicaid is a means-tested program, though, where you have to qualify for certain poverty thresholds in order to receive the supports. It also varies from state to state how much support is available. And frankly, because of legal matters that are accepted, essentially long-term care services and supports through Medicaid are rationed when the funds run out at a state in a given year. I think a lot of what we're witnessing with caregiving supports for caregiving in America reflects that term that was in that Medicare statute, custodial care. At the same time that America committed to paying for medical care, it was unable to even conceptualize what it means to provide care for someone who was disabled. Indeed, the word caregiver wasn't even in, used in the English language lexicon at that time. It was not until the 1980s that we began to use the word caregiver to describe that person who essentially supports the mind of another person whose mind is being transformed by a disease. The concept of caregiving is as old as the Bible. In the book of Ruth, Ruth is, is cared for by her daughter-in-law, Naomi. And yet nowhere in the book of Ruth is she called Ruth's caregiver. She's just a good daughter-in-law doing what good daughter-in-laws do when their mother-in-law has no one else to care for them. I thought that the pandemic would make us realize how important humans are to care for other humans. Because as we all know, when humans were put into lockdown and taken away from access to visitors in long-term care residential facilities or visitors in hospitals, that we would realize that not all visitors are visitors, that they're essential mind support for a damaged mind, much like aducanumab or, well, I'll say lecanumab, uh, is a support for the mind that's damaged by uh, beta amyloid plaques. I thought that after the pandemic, 
that we would realize that we need to support America's caregivers. But that hasn't happened. In the, stat, in the language that was drafted for the, uh, after the uh, uh, pandemic, uh, uh, the uh, Inflation Recovery Act or whatever Biden called it, there was clear support to expand the wages paid to uh, p providers of long-term care services and supports. But that was rapidly lined out in the negotiations and was never part of the inflation of the uh, uh, Recovery Act. And so we never have made any progress in expanding long-term care services and supports. And this matters because the hours spent caregiving are the argument for why this disease is such a problem. The triple digit billion dollar cost of Alzheimer's in America of dementia is not the cost of providing medical care. It's taking the hours that a spouse, a daughter, and rarely a son spend caring and putting a wage on it and then calculating the wages spent by America's families caring for disabled fam family member disabled from dementia. These wages are wages that are not available for other things a family needs, like paying for uh, 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 college tuitions. These wages cause people to have to be out of the workforce and therefore not paying into Social Security or advancing in their jobs. So America is paying for long term care services and supports, but it's the American family paying out of their strained pocket that's doing this. What it will take is amending Medicare to uh, expand its coverage for long-term care services and supports. This isn't a radical idea. In Japan, in Germany, and in the Netherlands, long-term care services and supports are backed up by the government. Germany has had a system in place for over 25 years, paid for by a payroll tax. It's solvent and it works, and it keeps the German family from the fiscal threat that they would face when a family member is diagnosed with dementia. So we can do this. We just have to muster the political will. We also have to recognize that for persons living with dementia, the theory of um, at home is best has to be questioned. Increasingly, over the last decade or so, Medicaid has directed its funds towards what are known as home based community based services and supports in the home. This means that they'll provide support for a family member to give care in the home. But sadly, as we know in this disease, there comes a time when home is no longer working. A person being at home is lonely, the person caring for them is overwhelmed, and a residential setting with experts in how to care for people with damaged minds is what's needed. But unfortunately, the trend in America is to not provide good quality residential long-term care. Indeed, the nursing home has become a dreaded place and also an industry used by venture capital in order to simply make money, not to deliver care. So we need to really rethink what it means to have residential long-term care. Finally, we need to think about in the beginning of the disease, the laws that we've set up to support someone to exercise their autonomy. Right now, you're either competent or capable or you're not competent and not capable. That's the way the law envisions things. For the vast majority of people living with these diseases, they have marginal capacity. They're able to make decisions but they need someone else to support them. That's oftentimes the caregiver. But we don't recognize the role of the caregiver in the law to help people make decisions. There's a concept known as supported decision-making developed in the world of uh, disability rights that allows an adult to be designated as the supporter for another adult to help them make decisions. This isn't a guardianship. It doesn't strip the rights from that individual, but it recognizes for financial matters, for medical matters, that this other person should be there and be part of the decision-making process. This could go a long way to support the lives of persons with MCI or mild stage dementia. Finally, I'll close with a somewhat dark topic of it's all very well to know when to start the treatments that Dr. Arnold talked about, but when should we stop them? And after we stop those treatments, how should we care for someone? Hospice benefits are limited to people who have six or fewer months of life left to live. Prognostication in dementia is extremely difficult to know how long someone has to live. Many a time when I've referred one of my patients to hospice, the family will say to me, gosh, I wish we had access to this earlier. Why not? And I unfortunately have to say to them, we're lucky to have gotten it when you got it, given the controversies of access. So we need to rethink what palliative care is for this disease. 
when, as we say, the mind oftentimes is more damaged than the body and palliative care is needed. I thank you for this opportunity to talk about some of the policy initiatives that are needed, expanding access to long-term care services and supports, recognizing the role of supportive decision-making, rethinking and revolutionizing residential long-term care. These are things that we can do. We know how to do them. We just have to muster the political will to do them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalwish. Thank you, Dr. Arno. Thank you, Felicia. I, uh, I have to get used to calling you Miss Greenfield. The, we have a very engaged audience and lots of questions are coming in. I'd like to direct one of the first ones to Dr. Kalawish. So you talk about these very ambitious goals and one of them is how do we improve residential care? Where do we begin? And there's just so many, um, how, how would you go about doing that? I know there's political and there's practical issues. Can you talk a bit about how you might begin to tackle that? Now you're muted. Number one, we need to th re really rethink um, the financing that surrounds nursing homes. There's huge conflicts of interest in uh, nursing home ownership, such that the owners of the nursing home also will own the businesses that supply the nursing home. In a sense, for many corporations, nursing homes have become just simply real estate ventures. That's what they're there for. So we really need to re-scrutinize the business models that surround nursing homes. More generally also, the uh, memory care units are often embedded in assisted living facilities. I have no fundamental problem with assisted living, except assisted living sort of operates on a state-by-state -state ad hoc basis. Um, there are some really good models out there for developing residential settings for individuals living with dementia. I think the greenhouse model is a good example of how architecture and staffing can be thoughtfully deployed to create a space that allows an individual's mind to be supported. But this just requires the recognition that the kind of sort of hospital ward design that we have for residential long-term care just simply doesn't serve a mind that needs support. Um, so those are all steps that we can do, reforming the regulations, the financing structures, and embracing, frankly, the building of facilities uh, that that uh, uh, adhere to the kind of principles developed by programs like the Greenhouse Program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And going backwards too, uh, to uh, Felicia, could you, uh, there have been several people asking about the article you mentioned. How would they go about finding it and forwarding it? Perhaps we could do this. Uh, yeah, on yeah, website. I could. That that's a. It's an article that I downloaded from the Penn uh, Online Library, um, twenty eighteen, uh, the Gerontologist Journal. Um, <clears throat> and if if Lena, is it possible yes, to yes. send send a PDF of that out? Simple to the enough. Audience? So those okay. of you who are interested, please uh, send a message to info at bossmarathon dot com, and we'll make sure to get it out to you info info at bossmarathon.com and we'll always respond and um, going back to there is a follow-up question of to uh, Dr. Kalawish uh, I'm not aware that a U.S. payroll tax to pay for LTSS has ever been legislatively proposed it, is it realistic that it will be um, the last effort uh, in the United States to create a system of long-term care services and supports was in the 1980s, the 1988 uh, presidential election. Um, and every single candidate uh, lined up in support of creating a, uh, an essentially a Medicare style benefit for long-term care services and supports paid for, paid for out of a payroll tax. Because you have to have a tax that essentially covers everyone who uh, is going to tap into a widely spread risk, hence payroll tax is a good model. Uh, Long-term care 88 never became statute because there was one candidate who just wouldn't come down in favor of, of it, and that was uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. He, of course, would go on to win the election. Since then, uh, the political climate has been one that has uh, never advanced any significant uh, legislation to address this. It was The Class Act was buried in the Obamacare Act but it was widely recognized from the moment it was written that it was actuarially unsound and essentially died even after passage. Uh, so uh, remind, let me do give you a somewhat bleak uh, statement. Um, one half of the American political system, if you look at it by the parties, 
has come down plainly saying that raising taxes is an anathema and we won't do it. And so as long as you have a political party simply saying any increase in steps to increase revenue is a non-starter, you pretty much have a non-starter for addressing the problem through taxation, which is mm -hmm. disappointing. Yeah. Thank you. So Dr. Arnold, here's a question. It's very broad. Um, do we now accept amyloid and tau as causes of AD? So yes, uh, but it's not sufficient. So I, I think we define the disease by the presence of amyloid um, and tau, uh, the, the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease. And that's how we've actually defined it since, you know, 1900, when Alois Alzheimer's first started um, discussing it uh, or, or, or showing it. Um, but I think that we do recognize that um, that the causes may be much more complicated and whether amyloid and tau are cause or consequence or both of more fundamental cell brain, you know, neuronal changes or inflammatory changes in the brain, that is still a question. For some people, I think that it is primary. There are some rarer forms of Alzheimer's disease that are based, you know, genetically based, genetic, um, um, you know, dominant genes that if they are mutated will cause Alzheimer's disease. And that seems to start with amyloid um, uh, and it then develops the tau and, and the, the like. Other more sporadic, the much more common and heterogeneous uh, forms of, of Alzheimer's disease. I think amyloid and tau may be part of the, the, the complicated web of changes that occur with aging. Um, and so it gets a little tricky to, to, to say that it is the cause. Um, we know, and I think that we do feel confident that it is a contributor and maybe a major contributor, and for some people, maybe the first cause, um, but for other people, it may just be um, in, the, in the mix of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. This one is, uh, I think, Felicia, you, you might be the, the best person to first tackle it. Um, this comes from a physician. One of the biggest struggles I face as a geriatrician caring for older adults with dementia and daughter-in-law of a person with Alzheimer's is the cost of hiring good caregiving help. 100% agree that good caregiving is the most important intervention we have, and I'm concerned that Medicare may pay for expensive diagnosis and immunotherapy while it doesn't cover caregiving. What shall we do? And in many ways, this is also Dr. Kalawish's point. <laughs> so. Um, Felicia, you want to take a uh, take a stab at that? Sure. I mean, I think that Dr. Karlowish um, addressed that, and when he when he spoke about what Medicare does cover and uh, and what it doesn't cover, and it doesn't cover um, in home care givers. So um, you might have a need to you know um, you might need help with activities of daily living bathing, grooming, um, uh, you might not be physically able to do that for the person for whom you're caring and you might need to bring someone into the home. The average cost in Philadelphia is about $25 an hour with a three hour minimum for that level of care and it's not covered by Medicare. There are some waivers available through area agencies on aging and again, um, like Medicaid, they are income based. So it is expensive. And I'll see if Jason, you know, has anything to, to add. Yeah, I mean, the problem, I think it's only more amplified when it's not about basic activities of daily living, bathing and dressing. But, you know, instrumental activities are the things that let humans flourish. I mean, two thirds of the course of living with Alzheimer's or other causes of dementia, like Lewy body disease, is impairments in things like ordering a meal, planning a trip, getting to that place to enjoy a place, like to a museum or whatnot. And that's pretty much two thirds of what caregiving is. Uh, that's very poorly supported. 
And most families are left to sort of figure it out on their own, either doing it themselves, which I think there's a real moral role to do because they know the person well, or hiring someone quite skilled at that to support the mind of the person with dementia. I like to think of caregiving as mind support. And once you frame it that way, you see how morally important it is. And you also see how we don't even acknowledge that role of caregiving, namely supporting the mind of the person, let alone have available people skilled at providing that kind of service. We reduce it to sort of, oh, well, let's, that means, oh, an in-home aide is going to get the person dressed and bathed. No, someone is going to take them out to do something because they can't transport themselves out of the house because they've lost all access to transportation and can't negotiate an iPhone to queue up an Uber. So how are we going to get them to someplace? So mm -hmm. those are the kind of caregiving skills that are needed. Adult day activity programs can provide that and or develop that kind of workforce. But those programs are woefully underfunded and again, paid for, you know, it's just simply out of pocket for mm -hmm. most individuals pay out of pocket and as well as some other supports they get from Medicaid and whatnot too. Yeah. So thank you. We have about two minutes left and I have a couple of quick questions. Is Dr. Arno accepting patients for diagnosis? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, <laughs> yes. yes, no, yes, yes. Okay. okay. Although I can't guarantee the schedule. So, <laughs> so and then there, uh, there's also a question. I uh, honestly, this is a real question. You think I'm? Uh, I just made it up to uh, promote my my podcast. Can you share some background about Bob's Last Marathon? So we started, and actually, I wanted to refer to a couple of episodes in it. I started this uh, podcast, this, we're in season three, about 60 episodes now, and it's directed at family and caregivers of, of, uh, and some professionals of people with Alzheimer's and other dementia. And I wanted to first refer you to um, when Dr. Arno just talked about uh, taking care, how do, you, how, do we ha uh, how do we develop a good lifestyle? Please take a look at the very first episode ever launched, Five Key Elements of Dementia Care. If you go to bossmarathon.com, you'll find this is, this is actually the, one of the most popular episodes from the beginning. And it, it, uh, I kind of chronicle my encounter, first encounter with Dr. Arno. At that time, he was at Memory, Memory Center. I brought my husband in and he said, these are the this is the way, this is where you get started. So, and also the Felicia Greenfield recently have lots of good episodes about making time together and how to take care of, uh, how to, uh, how to engage and how to speak with your loved ones. And, and so there's lots of good wisdom there. And, um, uh, I hope you, you check them out and also along the lines of, Medicaid and how to secure Medicaid help. We have episodes about those too. If you go to bobsmarathon.com, you can also uh, look for episodes by category. And you know, we're just broadly and see if you can find what you need. But most important, we really want to uh, know what you think. We really want your feedback. So if you could please stay on to the post roundtable survey, you can don't don't sign off yet. Wait a second after we conclude. And uh, and also, I want to say that Dr. Arno is giving a presentation on Friday, January 20, 20 that's this coming Friday, 12 p.m. Eastern via Zoom. If you are in and the title is Making a Difference Through Research. If you're interested, email me at lena at bobsmarathon.com and I'll send you a link to register. So stay on and please do take the poll and a very happy new year of the rabbit. <laughs> so please stay on. <laughs>